think this is the last video we're gonna watch. Okay. Um, <laughs> From Software's Game Design Changed Everything by uh, Nick Chiki. <laughs> okay. Uh, this came out uh, eight days ago as we're watching this, so. Uh, let's just watch. <laughs> From Software's game design has had a undeniable and profound effect on not only the gaming industry, but the industry of uh, Jacobs, the, of it, people named Jacobs, such as myself. With the massive <laughs> success of Elden Ring, From Software has further established that a merciless, uncompromising gameplay first design philosophy with little hand holding or assistance can also still be a massive success that millions of people will connect with and absolutely adore. I am certainly one of those millions. And while typically <laughs> brilliant, I also believe that From Software's games are unfortunately far from perfect, and Elden Ring is sadly no exception. And I want to talk about it. But first, I must warn you that I will be spoiling the absolute moonlight greatsword out of all of these games, so if you haven't experienced all them the spoilers, for yourself, all particularly the spoilers. Elden Ring, I strongly suggest you hit pause on this video and go save Honestly, that experience first. Honestly, I'm so bad at this. But honestly, even with spoilers, it's like, I don't really play these games. Like, I've tried them. I've tried Dark Souls. Uh, <laughs> like, I, I've i played Bloodborne. Um, but I'm not really a, a ginormous fan of them. I think they look great. I love watching playthroughs of them. I love, I love watching other people play them. They can be fun. But I'm just not... A hardcore fan like some people are. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, the spoilers for these, I, I probably won't even remember because I'm not really into them, so... <laughs> And come back in about 200 hours because it is quite possibly the greatest experience I have had Sorry, playing these games a video are game background in shit. my 28 yeah, years of that's... holding a Player 2 Mad Cat's controller that isn't actually plugged in. Regardless, <laughs> I believe it is no exaggeration to <laughs> have say you ever that done in that? the world of video games... You... <laughs> Has anyone ever done that to you when you were younger? They would like... Or have you ever done that to someone else? Like, I did that, did that to like kids I had to babysit last second and I'd be playing a game and I would give them a controller that's not plugged in. <laughs> games from software They'd get into it. They'd get into it. Everything. They thought they were somebody. Demon's Souls was released in 2009 for the PlayStation 3 and was nothing like other big games you coming just out them they at can't the time, play. especially Phoenix, you're in 2009. In a year where games were becoming more and more cinematic and accessible and forgiving to a casual audience, Demon's Souls crawled out of a wet crypt and said, I will kill you. Demon's Souls, <laughs> like all the Souls games that came after it, is a very challenging and unforgiving video game, a difficulty that fans of the series often lovingly refer to as hard but fair. Hmm. So let's, let's maybe settle on hard, but mostly fair. After joining FromSoft in 2004 and working as a coder on the Armored Core series, Hidetaka Miyazaki took over as director on a struggling high fantasy project that was running into some serious issues during development. Because the project was already seen as a failure inside the studio, Miyazaki was basically like, I'm gonna take this thing and I'm gonna take it in, I'm gonna take it out back to the garage, I'm gonna do some stuff to it. Inspired by FromSoft's own Kingsfield series, Miyazaki wanted to make a dark fantasy fantasy gameplay driven experience in collaboration with Sony Japan Studios. Yeah, these just aren't your style, are they, Phoenix? experience that took gaming back to its basics, something he felt was dying out at the time. During development, Miyazaki actually tried not to keep the harsh out. difficulty aspect on the low from publisher Sony, fearing that they might want to change it for being a bit too extreme, much like a BMX would you, riding. Would you play one if they had like a musical <laughs> edition one? Breaking down Could the you basic gameplay of Demon's Souls <laughs> will effectively break down the basic gameplay for all of the Souls games that followed because the very core design pillars have gone largely unchanged. It starts with a character creator that before you say anything, I know, it, it gets better with time, <laughs> that lets you pick a starting okay, class dictating okay. your capability. To be fair, Phoenix, I remember when we, uh, was it the first Dark Souls that we played together? Or was it the, I can't remember which Dark Souls we played together, but I remember we spent like an hour or so on the character creation and it was fucking hilarious what you ended up making. 
abilities with I remember that different shit. weapons or magic. A third person lock-on camera system for combat that improves on the Z targeting system that Ocarina of Time introduced back in uh, 00 of 98 that you can control the camera and attack <laughs> oh, people nine, at the same time, which was kind of a breakthrough in and of itself. Animation based combat that requires you to commit to each action and wait until the animation finishes before you can do something else, along with managing how that action affects your stamina bar or in the case of casting spells your magic bar. Yeah, but I remember I it was at like that apartment you were living spells. in this and you stole your just like neighbor's father, internet. Father before him. A dodge roll that contains <laughs> invincibility frames or iframes, meaning that if you time your dodge right, nothing can possibly it might have been you. three. Similar to action games like Devil May Cry. Corpse running where if you die, you drop all the currency you've racked up from killing enemies and you gotta make it back to that spot without dying, otherwise you lose it forever. Passive and non-passive online interaction where other players can leave helpful tips or uh, whatever the opposite of a helpful tip is, along with summoning or <laughs> being summoned as a random cooperator to help or invasions to either kill or be I killed. Kill you. And you know, the gameplay of each individual Souls game obviously goes a lot deeper than that with different complex systems and healing items and Okay, but I remember we played it at that apartment you were staying in where you were stealing the neighbor's internet. And I know I haven't recorded. I haven't recorded. Like, I still have the video somewhere. I don't know if I have it on my YouTube channel or if it's, like, private or something. Yeah, I don't know. I think you were in charge of making the character. <laughs> yeah, no. It just sounds cooler that saying you steal it, though, you know. God. Stupid, convoluted <laughs> bullshit like world tendency that you need a fucking master's degree to understand. But the challenging <laughs> and methodical combat system, that has always been the beating heart of all of these games. A heart that's married to an, another heart. Exploration. You know how in my Rockstar's game design video, I really harp on how those games constantly berate you with hyper-specific instructions and yellow map markers and assume you have the IQ of a tiny baby rat? Yeah, the Souls games <laughs> do like the exact polar opposite. The tiny baby rat is now actually a boss and you have no idea what the fuck is going on. And what makes exploration so compelling in Demon Souls and really all Souls games is that it is true exploration that really makes you feel like Batman. No, it really makes you feel <laughs> like an explorer. There is no detailed map that you can rely on and consult, only your own sense of direction and understanding of a space. This, along with a strong challenge and an actual fear of having something to lose with the corpse running system, makes discoveries and victories feel that much more meaningful and rewarding. Because you really feel like you, the player, actually charted and conquered a space and overcame a significant challenge instead of just watching fucking Wally do it in a cutscene. The Souls games have very few cutscenes or long unskippable passages of dialogue by NPCs or RPG conversation trees where your choice actually doesn't really matter. Instead, the story is discovered and slowly unraveled by the player through observing their environment and reading item descriptions and inevitably watching Vati Vidya videos because because I don't understand any of this. <laughs> You're saying the rat was like a king at some point? Or? I appreciate Miyazaki's approach to storytelling though because it's very unique to the medium of video games and was actually inspired by his real life experience of reading English language sci-fi and fantasy books as a kid that he couldn't fully understand but would fill in the gaps using his imagination. The story is so much more about the general mood and atmosphere and feeling of exploring a place rather than scripted plot points or set pieces. The innovative online elements of summoning random strangers to help you out was actually inspired by Miyazaki's real life as well, where after his car was trapped in snow on a hill, a random group of strangers showed up and helped push the car out of the snow and then mysteriously drifted off into the night like ghosts drifting in and out of his world at a poorly frame paced 30 frames per second. These games also have some technical <laughs> issues. Demon's Souls was not an immediate success. Sony decided to not publish it in North America after feeling pretty negatively about it before its release. During the Tokyo Game Show in 2008, Sony president Shuei Yoshida played it for two hours 
couldn't get past the starting area and then stopped playing and said, this is an unbelievably bad video game. Ooh, <laughs> this is the same that guy that years well. later would Platinum Bloodborne and that game is like way harder. So spoiler alert, From Software changed everything. The titular line. It wasn't until later in 2009 when Atlas would publish the game in North America that sales would slowly start to pick up and critics would start to take notice. Western audiences generally loved it because apparently we're all sick masochistic bastards and <laughs> GameSpot even gave it their game of the year. It does the give off that vibe, and doesn't Uncharted it? <laughs> 2 and Modern Warfare 2 came out. But along with establishing the core pillars of what a Souls game would be, it's important to talk about just how brave Miyazaki from Software and Sony Japan Studio were for making such a different kind of game. Demon Souls was a huge risk, an imperfect, weird, brutal passion project that was expected by everyone to flop but refused to compromise on its design goals and eventually found an audience that really connected with it. In two console generations later, an extremely faithful remake was published by Sony as a launch title for the PlayStation 5. And there you have it. That's uh, that's it. That's the end. It's the, it's the only game they ever made. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I love Dark Souls. But I also hated Dark Souls. My brother Isaac had played Dark this Souls. This is a very common feeling among the fan 2011 base. And had repeatedly told me to play it. I eventually finally tried it, uh, got past the tutorial section after a lot of struggling, made it to Firelink Shrine, wandered the wrong way into a graveyard full of skeletons. As oh, I know yeah, I remember this did. area. That graveyard eventually became a dark f tunnel of skeletons that. Uh, killed me a bunch of times, <laughs> and then I promptly said F this game and stopped playing. I can't remember for what exact reason, but a year or two later, I tried the game again, probably because of my brother's insistence once again, the bastard he is, and uh, <laughs> it was different. This time, it stuck. Not only did it stick, but it seriously changed my life. I know that sounds super dramatic, but like, it completely changed the way I look at video games and why I like to play them and made me want to talk about them more and examine them. And it absolutely ruined most other video games for me because once I finished it, nothing could fill the giant rat boss size. <laughs> <laughs> in my heart. Now, if I were to go into all of the reasons why Dark Souls is so significant in gaming history, we would be here all day and my editor would absolutely hate that. I am going to kill you. But on my road to eventually talking about Elden Ring, I do need to touch on three crucial aspects that vastly improved on Demon Souls game design. Super Exploration DX Turbo Edition with fuckles. Estes Flask, I hardly know her as best as I can. And Atmosphere, Atmosphere, you've been seen. I feel you inside my screen. <laughs> I, I also didn't like that. What I mean by Super Exploration DX Turbo Edition with fuckles is that Dark Souls <laughs> fundamentally changed how level design and world design worked within this gameplay formula that Demon Souls established. While Demon Holes over here had a hub world that let you freely fast travel to different zones of varying locales and difficulty levels, Dark Souls over here took a lot of its zones and stacked them on top of each other like a stack of pancakes and made sure that even if some pancakes have chocolate chips or some pancakes have bananas oh. that they all seamlessly flow into each other okay and now i'm just craving pancakes God damn it. world in this beautiful interconnected short stack of pancakes the blight down is like a pancake a made out of pigeons i'm so hungry <laughs> During now the first half of the game you have no fast travel and all of the areas are connected in multiple complex ways <gasps> like a maze so there's this palpable Ow. sense Ow. of danger Ow. and tension that slowly rises as you venture deeper and deeper into this beautiful mysterious world that is very clearly inspired by Berserk, which is amazing. That tension is brilliantly paired with the new edition of Bonfires. Resting points that let you catch your breath for a second and spend your hard-earned currency from fighting enemies and bosses on leveling up your stat points and refilling your much-needed Estus Flask. I am of the pretty firm opinion that the healing mechanics found in Demon Souls and Bloodborne and kind of Dark Souls 2 are vastly inferior to the standard Estus flask system found in the other souls games the estus has a specific amount of healing charges
charges that you can increase throughout the course of the game. And the only way to refill your charges is by resting at a bonfire, which also respawns all enemies in the I area. Kill you. Not only does this <laughs> provide an extra incentive to seek out and discover bonfires and push on while exploring, but it solves the dumbass problem those other games have where your healing items are a finite currency that you can run out of. Meaning that if you're struggling with the game and you keep dying, and you will, you will likely have to halt progression just to go grind mobs of weaker enemies for healing items or currency that you can then spend on healing items and not leveling up, which feels so unnecessarily punishing in a game where enemies do this to you. With the Estus, you at least know that for the next bit you have a guaranteed specific amount of heals, and much like a survival horror game, the goal is to get to the next area using as little Estus as bestus you can. I think one of the greatest single improvements over demon holes over here is demon the holes. Atmosphere. I will never forget that sounds how it more felt up your alley, get Phoenix. Lost in this world, playing with some my demon ass holes through undead burg and undead parish, and finally being rewarded by finding that shortcut back to Firelink Shrine and hearing that comforting music creep in. That that seriously changed the trajectory of my firstborn son's life. He's he's getting into brown now. Journeying <laughs> all the way down to first the depths and then Blight Town and then finding the entrance that's a secret to the Great Hollow and making my way down that Not and finally made by ending from... up at Ash Damn, Lake Phoenix. gave me a feeling Damn. that I will forever cherish. You went for the the ability to easily fast travel back up to Firelink Shrine after I journeyed all the way down there what if they're simultaneously had me holes? terrified and also in complete awe of the vertical scope of this world. And there's so much of this game that you can just completely miss. From Software doesn't care if every player sees all of the content that they made for this game and that makes finding the stuff that you do find feel that much more special and memorable. I know it's just all smoke and mirrors and code and textures but the illusion that From Software sells here is a powerful one. Except for some clearly unfinished areas towards the end of the game but those don't exist. You made Lost is a live up. Gaslight, gaslight, gaslight. <laughs> Unlike Demon's Souls, Dark Souls was a pretty instant success. Critics you don't loved like from the game Phoenix, really? I, I wouldn't be right able to tell. Bat, thanks to Bandai Namco publishing it all over the world on PS3 and Xbox 360 and PC with one of the most janky PC ports to ever exist. Shout out Games for Windows Live. I tried RIP. playing this uh, also annoyingly the led first to Dark so Souls many industry heads resorting to the phrases. It's like Dark Souls. I actually or, think this is the Dark Souls. Of I actually think I have a copy you can't buy anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it is, a, it's a little jank. <laughs> of blank when in reality all they're trying to say is that it's hard. Going to Arby's is like the Dark Souls of going to Carl's Jr. <laughs> Hollow Knight is very clearly inspired by From Software's approach and that game is undoubtedly the greatest Metroidvania ever made. I f***ing love Hollow Knight. Primarily because it perfected a design aspect from Dark Souls 1 that From Software themselves kind of started to abandon with subsequent Souls games non-linear exploration. Shut up already! Jesus, that guy loves to talk! <laughs> jakey, Jakey, and Jakey! Oh my god. Here we go. Jakey, Jakey, and Jakey, we have a lot of expenses. And a lot of those expenses are monthly subscriptions that we totally forget we're even paying for. Well, today's sponsor, Rocket Money, is here to help. Rocket Money is an all-in-one finance platform that helps you save more and spend less. This personal finance app allows you to manage subscriptions, lower bills, build a custom budget, and grow your savings all in one place. We personally use it to identify and securely cancel recurring charges or unwanted subscriptions, all with the simple tap of a finger, which is a godsend for the social anxiety of having to actually call people on the phone to cancel stuff. What is this, fucking 1882 oh, I fu Columbus? I fucking Sam hate Yoshi's that, like, 11? uh, like, <laughs> like there's some, I think it's one of the things that uh, gyms do, like gym memberships where the only way you can cancel it is if uh, you literally go down to your local gym or you send them a fucking letter in the mail. Like, what the hell? To this day, they still do that. Like, what the fuck? Come on. <laughs> Come on. There's, there's like, and then even then, it's not a guarantee they'll stop. 
Like I actually, I've actually talked to the bank people before, like at my bank, and they say they still have problems where they literally just have to. People will come in and ask them to literally block that payment, or they'll just change their bank account number. It's that bad, even to this day. We also use it to track our monthly spending and set budgets. Rocket Money notifies us if we exceed that budget, along with showing our spend to earn ratio every month, quarter, or year. Also, if you're like us and gonna turn 29 this year, maybe you're starting to pay a little bit more attention to your credit score. Well, Rocket Money alerts you of important changes to your score and also offers you insights on ways you could improve your score as well. To save more and spend less, join the 3.4 million members using Rocket Money. We've got the hookup. Go to rocketmoney.com slash Nakey Jakey, or click the link in the description to get started for free or unlock even more features with premium. That's rocketmoney.com slash Nakey Jakey to get started for free. Get your money right! All right, now let's get on back <laughs> to Naked Jake in the curious case of the floating rake <laughs> with this, this guy. This guy what? never even beat Digimon World 2. That's a real Souls game. I'm out of here. Dark Souls 2, <laughs> Bloodborne, and Dark Souls 3 all have much more straightforward progression paths than the first half of Dark Souls 1. And while a lot of areas in these games are technically connected and sometimes offer alternate paths, the general world design is far less interesting from a exploration point of view. And it doesn't mean that these games are bad. All of these games probably each deserve their own 40 minute feature presentation breaking them down, but for the sake of what I want to get into today, I'm just going to give you the Spark Notes version. Dark Souls 2 dropped in 2014 and was received well and sold well. It further grew the Souls game community and deepened combat systems while adding stuff like power stancing. Miyazaki didn't direct this one and it does show. The atmosphere of each zone feels a bit random and unconnected from the overall world, but the boss fights and DLCs are great and the game enjoyed a large online community for shit like PvP. Bloodborne was developed alongside Dark Souls 2 and was released exclusively for the PS4 in 2015. I didn't know they were and like I used money from a car accident that to close together. buy a PS4 in Bloodborne instead of paying my rent and contrary to what my financial advisors might be saying and, and Logan Roy looking ass I'd say it was a wise investment. Directed by Miyazaki, <laughs> Bloodborne felt like the true follow-up to Dark Souls 1. At least for people like me that just want to swing a big sword and f***ing parry everything. Bye-bye magic! Go back to f***ing Waverly Place! Faster combat that rewards aggressive play. Intricate and varied weapon movesets. An atmosphere that just drips out of your TV with such dedicated attention to detail and talent in the art design department and rats. Dark Souls 3 dropped in 2016 and by this point, the Souls series was poppin' and beloved by many people. Directed once again by Miyazaki, DS3 did everything right on paper. It kept some of the faster paced combat and fucked up enemy designs and boss transformations from Bloodborne, while also returning an expansive armory of weapons and magic, lending to a buttload of different kinds of builds. It has a large amount of fan service and callbacks to Dark Souls 1 and some of the hardest bosses seen in a Souls game yet. It also just feels really, really good to play and looks beautiful, but also something about this formula was starting to feel just a little bit stale. Don't get me wrong, playing through Dark Souls 3, especially doing co-op boss fights with my brother, was some of the most fun I've had in any of these games. But that strong sense of exploration felt in Dark Souls 1, that feeling of charting your way through a mysterious and dangerous world. I longed for that. The Dark Souls series had completely shaken the game industry and clearly inspired other developers to change how their games were designed and played. But playing Dark Souls 3 felt a bit like listening to From Software's greatest hits <laughs> versus hearing the band's I love the new album, album cover that though. Well, that's maybe great. Take them someplace new. Little did I know, From Software was in the studio working on their In Rainbows, as in the album In Rainbows by Radiohead as in Radiohead's best album, as in Elden Ring. <laughs> Some of you might be wondering, Jacob Matthew, why did it take you so long to make a video on Elden Ring? 
and I have two answers for you. A, last year I was very busy working on an album called Romcom, shout out jakeymerch.com. And B, this game is just too damn big and felt too daunting to dissect and talk about and I also just wanted to keep playing it, but I feel like I'm finally ready to get into it with my support group. Uh, that's you, this is you, this is all of you. Where do I even begin though? Elden Ring oh, no, isn't we're the support perfect, group. Yeah. but that's also what makes it so compelling. It's not properly balanced. I mean, none of these games are, they never have been. FromSoft has pretty clear favorites when it comes to certain weapons and buffs and spells. You can absolutely break these games in half if you really want to. But the sheer depth of content that Elden Ring slowly unveils to you during your 200 or so hours of playing it, the childhood fantasy of exploring a fantastical, magical world filled with swords and beasts and you guessed it, rats, is fully manifested <laughs> in a way Gotta that have the knows rats. no contemporary. There is no other Elden Ring than Elden Ring. This isn't just the Dark Souls of Dark Souls. This is the Dark Souls of Breath of the Wild. This is the Dark Souls of Red Dead Redemption 2. If you took a time machine back to 2003 and showed my wooden sword in the backyard swing an ass that this is what was coming in the future, I would have shot you in the head and called the cops. Elden Ring is <laughs> oh, truly the adventure of a lifetime. But because I've already spent so much time talking about the core design pillars that all of these games share, I want to instead focus on certain pillars that Elden Ring innovates on or potentially fails to innovate on. Exploration and scale, dungeons and dragons, starring Chris Pine, and difficulty and accessibility. Where Dark Souls 1's world is like a short stack of pancakes, all connected. Again, the pancakes, you're making me hungry, like dude. a giant stack of pancakes, and you took all those pancakes, and you spread them out across a giant table. And most of the pancakes are touching each other, and some of the pancakes have other pancakes hiding underneath them, and other pancakes might transport you to far pancakes in f***ed up ways, and some of the pancakes are on fire and make you what feel the here. I don't want to be in the <laughs> Denny's anymore. <laughs> Miyazaki has stated that Elden Ring is the closest thing to his ideal game that he would personally like to play. And that going open world enriches this ideal experience that he's trying to achieve. A game where if you saw something over there, you could actually go over there. A game that isn't open world just to be in the same category as some bloated Ubisoft bullshit, but a game <laughs> that's open world because it's always it okay needs to shit to on Ubisoft. In order to fully capture the fantasy of being an adventurer in a giant world, riding across a vast landscape on your trusty steed, you first need to have that vast landscape to really nail that feeling. Elden Ring was inspired by Breath of the Wild, and it very clearly shows, because like Breath of the Wild, Elden Ring knows and expects that your curiosity will naturally lead you to finding interesting things. There doesn't need to be an overwhelming list of things to check off or obvious map markers going over here. It's fucking over here. Because that would totally rob the player of a true sense of mystery and discovery when exploring this massive world. Elden Ring is very okay with hiding its hand. This is what the map looks like when you start the game and this is what it looks like when you finish the game. And these are the pancakes that are cooking underneath you the entire time. Having a chest <laughs> throw a smoke grenade at you in the starting area I'm and hungry for being pancakes transported now. and I waking up in God. one of the and most giant late game areas and checking the map and seeing it zoom out like that was an experience I will never forget. And the lore behind the lands between is so rich in detail and intrigue. Miyazaki's style of storytelling through gameplay combined with the Bible of world history that George R. R. Martin developed for this game will leave an MF feeling like goddamn Amy Adams, as in downright enchanted. I know I haven't mentioned Sekiro once in this video because it's technically not a Souls game, but it was a crucial stepping stone towards Elden Ring's development. The addition of a dedicated jump yeah, button may this sound like a simple thing, but it completely changes combat and the way you navigate this world. Exploring the lands between over like 200 hours rivaled the experience I had exploring the first half of Dark Souls 1. They both hit really hard, but 
for different reasons. The first half of Dark Souls 1 hits hard because of a lack of a fast travel safety net, meaning you become very intimate with your surroundings and the world design nearly suffocates you with its complexity. It suffocates in a good way. <laughs> Elden Ring hits hard not only because it marks the return it suffocates of in a good areas way, connecting to each other with a very non-linear path of progression, but because of just the sheer scale of the world. But because the sheer scale and intrigue of always wanting to see what's around the next corner is such a big part of this experience, much like Breath of the Wild, the game won't ever hit quite as hard on subsequent playthroughs because that main draw of discovery is no longer there. This doesn't mean you shouldn't play multiple playthroughs of this game because oh my god weapons and spells and armor sets and ashes of war and summoning summoning salt videos quest lines <laughs> that you can super easily miss and you will because they're super convoluted and hard to follow. You should definitely play the game a second time. But I will say that on my second playthrough I definitely wasn't as eager to revisit all of the content once I knew what was exactly around every corner. Elden Ring has a massive amount of unique and amazing content to experience. But there's also some super not amazing content in there too. In Joseph Anderson's review, which is great by the way, he talks about how amazing his first fight with a dragon was. And I completely agree, that first encounter with a dragon in that big ass wet field or whatever, and he's like breaking all of the physics objects. It's Don't get amazing. how people it's say hard to follow It's awesome a gameplay thing. moment that is just naturally experienced yeah. in your exploring of the world. It's but like I me, I get Joseph's lost too easily and it, game it does help like me mentally in a game if I have like so many quest markers or the options for one have the same move set it kind of takes away a bit of it's easy to tell where I need to go experience it doesn't mean that first experience I like exploring in a game but it's also bad but more I, so, it's I also like, like to see where I'm going <laughs> for dinner every night and eventually you were like all right I don't really want to eat dragon pizza anymore can we can we have like rat pizza mom the same <laughs> goes rat for pizza? a lot of Elden so Ring's catacomb dungeons similar to the chalice dungeons in Bloodborne or the shrines in Breath of the Wild, the quality of experience you might have in one of these copy-paste interiors is a bit of a dice roll. In all of the Souls games, you never know exactly what items you're going to find as rewards while exploring, but the areas and bosses are usually so interesting to look at and explore that the real reward is really just getting to experience that area and fight that cool boss. So even if the reward is something you're never going to use, like like another fucking spell, you don't really regret doing it because it was a really cool experience. The same does not apply to Elden Ring. All of these catacombs are not created equally. Some will have a cool and unique boss and a really useful piece of loot, and others will have a boss you've already seen a bunch of times and an item oh, that you God. will forget about the second you leave the catacomb. Funny enough, this is actually a problem that's remedied by a second playthrough, because if you have a wiki open, you can just avoid doing Doing all the dungeons that aren't worth it. But on a first playthrough, the one that's the best and the most memorable, you don't know what all of these have. So if you're like me, you're probably going to do all of them and get pretty burnt out on fighting the same little statue fuckers in these pieces of shit. For the most part, <laughs> the enemy and boss variety on display in Elden Ring will blow your back out most of the time. But seeing unique experiences that you've cherished, like the reveal and spectacle of fighting Asta natural boy of the void get copy pasted into a separate dungeon or fighting a godskin fucker both of them for like the fifth time it's a bit disappointing the nice thing about Elden Ring though is that you technically don't have to do most of this if a boss is too hard or if an area is too annoying for you you have so many other options of things to do and bosses to fight and places to see but this also potentially leads to some issues with the game design. Previous Souls games that had a more linear progression path could quickly halt your progress with a super tough boss, and you would have to either grind enemy mobs for souls to level up or just slam your head against a wall until you hopefully eventually break through. Elden Ring being mostly non-linear actually remedies that problem and finally adds a sort of difficulty slider to the Souls games. If a boss is giving you a swirly, just go do something else. Maybe find <laughs> a better weapon, learn some new skills, or spend time practicing your parries against weaker bosses. I don't know, there's a lot of stuff you could do. Then once you're better prepared, head on back to that boss that was 
fucking you up and say it's opposite day, you slug. Huzzah! That's pretty amazing, right? It's this makes the game day. so much more accessible and less intimidating to a new player that's never been beaten to death by a rat before. But this system of sort of choosing your own difficulty could also potentially rob you of a compelling experience. This game is so goddamn big that there's bound to be stuff in the early areas that you won't find until way later in the game. And when you do find it, maybe it's a super awesome, unique boss battle with like a really cool reward that you beat in like two hits. In some cases, this feels amazing. It fully feeds into the power fantasy of wanting to make the biggest fucker alive and can be super satisfying to just totally fart on a boss that once had you breaking two by fours from Menards over your leg. But sometimes it can feel underwhelming and disappointing. I think the fact that the game doesn't have level scaling for enemies is much better than an alternative where it did. Because level scaling can often make a game world feel pretty artificial and your progression feel pretty meaningless. But I do think there's a world where you could have a bit of both. I think if you visit areas in the game that you're very obviously over leveled for, the game could maybe flash a little prompt that says, hey, do you want to make this fight scale to your level to maybe make it a bit more satisfying and maybe we give you extra runes as a reward for upping the difficulty? I would love that. Mark Brown of Game Maker's Toolkit makes a great point in his video about how Hollow Knight actually changes the layout of early areas and ups the difficulty of enemies to keep things more challenging and interesting later in the game. And I think that's a great example of something that Elden Ring could have potentially done as well. Speaking of rune rewards for defeating enemies, holy shit, they are all over the place in this game and make like zero fucking sense. Donkey talks about this in his Elden Ring video and I wholeheartedly agree. Like the difficulty of an enemy does not correlate to how much money you get for defeating them. It's honestly ridiculous in a lot of cases. <laughs> also, let's talk about respecking stat points. Once you defeat Renala at the Wizard Academy Raya Lucaria, you unlock a way to use specific larval tier items to reallocate all of the stat points that you've spent money on, and this is amazing. This means that if you find a weapon or spell that you really fuck with but don't have the stats for, you can retool your character to be able to use them and switch up your playstyle and experience one of the many amazing builds that you can do in this game. So why the f can't you do the same thing with weapons? Elden Ring <laughs> offers no way of transferring or respecking weapon upgrades from one weapon to another, and it makes zero fucking sense to me. You find so many fucking cool weapons in this game, and it is a total pain in the ass to make switching to them actually viable. Yes, you can find the smithing bells that let you buy an unlimited amount of upgrade resources from the merchant, but A, what if you don't find some of those bells on your first playthrough where you're not looking stuff up. And B, I don't understand what the harm would be in letting you get back some of your upgrade resources from a weapon if it meant that that weapon went back to its base level. Right? You would be so much more excited to find shit even if it's something out of your typical wheelhouse. The Resident Evil 4 remake, which is fantastic by the way, I talk about it on my second channel, Jaquan the Jeek will like, subscribe, rate, comment, <laughs> five stars, <laughs> lets you sell weapons five you've stars. upgraded back to the merchant and you get most of the money that you've put into upgrading that weapon, which is amazing. So why can't Elden Ring have the same thing? Another thing that can feel so ass backwards and outdated are the NPC side quests and how you progress them. These games have always had super convoluted NPC side quests, and I know it's partly because Miyazaki knows that with the internet, everyone's gonna get together and figure it out so you can afford to make it complicated and whatever. I, I get that. But I still think that some of these more basic ones should be doable by just using your common sense. It's one thing to have NPCs not progress their dialogue or do something until you go rest or leave the area when it's a smaller, more linear game, but it's an entirely different thing to have that same bullshit in a massive open world game where people are supposed to move around from place to place but will never do it while you're watching them so you gotta go rest at a bonfire and then wait no wait I messed up you gotta rest again to load the guy in because it's not nighttime if you rested and then died and then came back <laughs> like what the fuck 
I went where what? the f***er told me to. Why does this require so many other extra unseen steps? I only bitch and moan about this because the writing and voice acting in this game is so, so good. Like so heartbreakingly good. And because the storytelling and lore bits are so few and far between, you'll f***ing chase after whatever scraps you can find. But at the end of the day, I make these videos to criticize the things that I love. Video games. I love them so, so, so very much. And I love Elden Ring more than most other video games. I am so eternally grateful to be alive in the same timeline that From Software is cranking out games of this quality. Elden Ring is not only a continuation of the Dark Souls franchise, it is an evolution of From Software's trailblazing game design. A design that I think defined the last 10 years of gaming, and with Elden Ring could very well define the next 10 years of gaming as well. A massive journey with some of the most beautiful vistas I've seen since Windows Vista and some of the most <laughs> challenging, <laughs> grueling no, bosses not the that I've taken Vista. on and overcome <laughs> since Windows Vista. Thank you <laughs> to Hidetaka Miyazaki and From Software for taking a chance with Demon Souls. Thank you for making some of my favorite games ever made. And thank you for watching this video. I'll see you later, gamers. <laughs> what what is happening okay that ending though <laughs>